welcome to Living Word Church of Calvary. So we're going to get started with some praise and worship songs here. It looks a little different up here. It's because Dave's not here. <laughs> and neither is Shannon. We got a text from them this morning saying that they're not feeling well. So uh, keep them in your prayers. And also heard from Crystal, and she's taking a patient of hers, taking care of a patient of hers. So uh, we're missing a few people today, but we soldier on, right? <laughs> Good morning, Danny. Good morning. Good morning, church. Thank you, Monty and the worship team. No matter what uh, gets thrown in your guys' path, you guys always pull through and never disappoint. So thank you. How about a round of applause for these guys? They work really hard. Thank you guys so much. 
and Happy New Year's Eve to everyone. Man, two, 2024, can you believe it? Already, it's coming. Man, and, it, and like I said uh, last week, 365 times in the Bible it says, do not fear. So starting tomorrow, January 1, every single day you can read, do not fear. And that's exactly what we should do. We should uh, not fear because God tells us not to. A um, few announcements I have is the first Saturday of the month will be movie night. So January 6th, I'm not sure what trails got planned for the movie night, but that will be here at 6 p.m. They always have food and a movie, so bring your family, bring your kids. It's always a good time. The second Saturday, I believe, is the 16th, will be um, 13th, is it? I don't I'm not good at math. Jesse, thanks for pointing that out. Um, the second Saturday will be the men's prayer breakfast. So guys, please prayerfully consider to come join us for that. It's a really good time. We get together and fellowship, uh, have a little devotional, and it's just a good time to fellowship with like-minded Christian men, um, get to know each other, help each other out. It's, it's really good to get together. So please prayerfully consider, and it's always good food, real good food. Obvious, and then after that, they're going to have women's ministry meeting, I believe. Are you, do you know if that's should be a women's ministry meeting. That is open to all of you ladies in the church. If you want to join the ladies for that, please join them for the women's ministry meeting. They talk about future events, what's coming up, how to help the community, and all different kind of things. The women's ministry really is the oil in the gears that keeps this thing going. So please join those ladies and get involved with that. Please consider that. Um, other than that, the men's and women's Bible studies will resume on the 9th. Women's at 645 and men's at 7 p.m. Tuesday nights right here in the church. So guys, it's not too late to join us. We're doing a study on the book of Daniel, so please join us upstairs for that. It's not too late for that. And ladies, if you want to get into a Bible study, 645 p.m. Tuesday nights, join us here. Also, 830 in the morning on Tuesday mornings. There's another ladies' Bible study for the ladies that might not be able to make it in the evening. Join them for the morning Bible study. They would love to have you. 8.30, right? 8.30 a.m. Tuesday mornings. Um, other than that, I don't really have a whole lot of announcements yet going into So that's good. We don't have a whole lot of pressure going into the first of the, you know, January 1st. So... With that being said, we can jump in. We have, uh, this is the last one in December, so we all can recite Isaiah 7, 14 that we had. That's the December memory verse, so I'll start it off, and we can all, if, if you didn't memorize it, which I know every one of you did, memorized it, it, it's here in your bulletin as well. So I'll start it off. Therefore, the Lord himself will give, us, give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and we will call him Emmanuel. Thank you guys so much. The memory verses, they're so important. So every week in January, we're going to do Ephesians 5, 15 through 16. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. That's a really good verse to memorize, especially as we're going into a new year, um, so please memorize your memory verses. I will see you guys next week. I don't see anybody yelling at me if I missed anything. So thank you guys. I'm going to give it back to Monty. We're going to have a meet and greet. So please, during this worship song, take some time, meet your neighbors. Thank you.
Okay, if you could find your way back to your seats and uh, join with us on singing How Great Is Our God.
thank you. You all did real fine out there. <laughs> seated. Lord God, we come to you in Jesus' name, thanking you for this day, thanking you for this fellowship, thanking you for this church, where we are all family here. Um, ask a special blessing for those who couldn't be with us today. Ask that you'll be with Pastor Rick and Cheryl as they travel. Uh, be with Dave and Shannon and help them recover quickly. Ask a special blessing on our speaker today that you may uh, fill him with your spirit so that we may hear your word today. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. 
it's hard to believe that an, another year's flying by us going by and in just a few hours you'll be able to watch the, the fireworks blowing off of the peak and uh, people calling for Ubers and taxi rides home from, from the parties that they're going to and stuff. But I don't, I don't understand maybe just my weird way of thinking why we celebrate the passage of time when time's the one thing we really want to hold on. We don't want, we got an end date and we want to stay as far away from that as we can, you know, but when it, the new years and birthdays and stuff are like, woohoo, another year's gone. We're all happy. We shouldn't be happy about that because we're, we're edging closer to this, but, but we celebrate it and it's, it's that time of year to celebrate it. And, and uh, so I was thinking of things that happened over the past year to maybe be able to talk about and stuff and, and uh, just looking at maybe headlines and stuff through the, on my computer and stuff of what what the been happening in the world and stuff like that and and uh, got kind of kind of hard pressed uh, to find anything <laughs> anything good or anything to talk about and and all of us have had good things happen this year bad things happen to us uh, and everything um, we started our year off uh, in in a in a bad way uh, exactly one year ago today 15 minutes before the new year my mother-in-law died uh, Marla's mom and uh, and just this morning and um, Rick's brother-in-law Joe O'Connor passed away uh, many of you probably know Joe and and uh, so that's kind of hard they're, they're going to be starting their their year off uh, in a way that uh, they don't want to and we'll, we'll pray for the family at the at the end of this uh, and everything so keep them in your thoughts and your prayers but we've all had good things happen in our year and bad things and uh, I, I was thinking about that and Rick said he said when you speak this morning just be yourself just give them a, a, a envelope full of Tim <laughs> so can I get turned up Robert thank you that might be a little much but <laughs> but Rick told me Rick said just to, to kind of be myself and and uh, so I was thinking of things that affected me um, through the year and uh, probably different than than something that affected all of you but if you were listening if you were fairly close to my house on June the 13th you probably heard a whole lot of screaming going on because the Denver Nuggets won the NBA title. And uh, I've been a Nuggets fan since their inception. Since and they interviewed a guy on the street afterwards. He goes, yeah, he goes, I've been a Nuggets fan since 1998. And, uh, you know, he's, that's 25 years. It's a pretty long time. But still, I, I remember listening to him in 1969 when they were the Denver Rockets. Uh, before they were even the Nuggets and, and uh, Byron Beck and all of them, you know, that were, that were on the team. And then I can, I can probably name almost all the players through the years from then till now. Uh, and we had to go get a Serbian horse farmer to help us win the championship, but we did it. <laughs> and uh, so we got that going. That was like one of my main, my main things that I found flipping through stuff. But as I started uh, looking at headlines and stuff, uh, on my computer, just going back through the months and stuff, it it got kind of depressing. It, it seems that there's an ever increasing intensity on the attack of of the truth, and in the midst of the attack um, on the truth is an ever increasing compromise on behalf of those who should be holding tightly to the truth. Um, that's got to do with, with churches and with, with us and everything. And so I chose to look at um, scriptures relating to truth and compromise. Scripture, even though it was written hundreds of years ago, by God's sovereign design is still relevant to us today or we wouldn't, we wouldn't even be looking at it. God wrote it all them years ago, but it's still relevant. It's still stuff that happens today. It says in Ecclesiastes, uh, 
1.9 that there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing, nothing new happens. What happened back then is happening today. Everything happens. Everything is new under the sun. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. It's, it's common to what, what's happening. Is, it's common. It happens, and it happens, and it's, and it's going to happen again, and, and things just happen. Nothing really gets new. Uh, Pastor Rick, a, a few months ago, I know it's been a while, but uh, he said that, Satan plays by the same handbook that he did in the beginning. That, that, that same deceptions that he used in the garden, he uses on us today. The same lies and, and everything. They're all, nothing is new. Maybe new to us, but it's not new to the world. Uh, the societal degradation that we witness today has actually been going on uh, for generations. My daily Bible readings have me in the middle of the prophets right now, Isaiah and Jeremiah and stuff, and, and God was, and to say he was angry is probably not even a strong enough word, but he was, he was angry with the Israelites and their idolatry. And he told them through the prophets, he says, I'm going to give you over to um, the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Egyptians. I'm going to give you to a people because you do not worship me. You do not love me. I'm not... I'm not your God anymore. You've replaced me with other things. And, uh, and he was, was angry about that. And he told the Jews when they came into the promised land to clean it out. If you bought a, a fixer-upper house and you went in, it's just filthy. It's just it's nasty. you got a lot to do. Yeah, you, the look on your face, Donna, tells me that you know what I'm talking about. But it's disgusting. And you, it, before you move in, it needs to be cleaned out. You need to clear it out, clean it out make it livable. And God told the Jews to do that when they went into the promised land. He said, clean this house out completely. Get rid of everything, clean it out, and move into the, what I want you to live in. And they didn't do it. You know, and, and if you move, they moved into the house and the, the, the married, intermarried with people that were already there and stuff that they weren't supposed to do. And 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 some of the, the people they intermarried with are like, you know, these these little things these little items, I don't want to get rid of them because they've been in my family for so long. So let's just set them up here on the shelf, and nobody will notice them. They'll be, you know, and they're like, okay, yeah, whatever, as long as nobody notices them. But they're there. That was an idol to them before they came in. That's an idol, and it's still in their house. They didn't clean it out. They didn't wipe that out. It's still there, and you're still going to end up worshiping that, and they did, and God got mad at them for that. And, and actually had to get rid of them. That, that idolatry, they wouldn't get rid of them idolatries. They chose um, to serve idols and other religions and traditions rather than serving the sovereign God. Uh, and that type of spiritual degradation uh, is still swamping the boat today. Yeah, if we look at it, environmentalism. Um, just... <laughs> No bueno. Socialism. It's being just forced down our throats. Our government is, is just winding towards that way. All of our college systems, it seems, have gone uh, socialistic on us and everything. And we envir all these isms, identity crisis-ism. I don't even know if there's an ism ab about that or whatever, but the, the identity crisis. You're just looking back at headlines. These things just uh, were just all over the place with that. And they all have one thing in common. They all attack the truth. They attack this. They know it's, it's inherent in us. We're going to read that. They know that it's the truth. They know that it's the word of God. But they attack it because they want us to join in with their lies. We are the target of what's going on. They all have one thing in common is they lie and they attack the truth. John MacArthur said this, the greatest danger to a system of lies is the truth. The greatest danger to a system of lies is the truth, and therein is the reason for the persecution against Christians. We have the truth, they know it, and they attack us with the lies. The premise of all these things is built on supposition and lies, and to fall into it is idolatry. 
Vody Bacham, Adam turned me on to, to him a couple years ago. Uh, he's an amazing preacher and a speaker and stuff. V-O-D-I-E, Vody Bacham. Uh, if you've never looked him up, you need to look his stuff up because he's, he's fabulous. Uh, he wrote this. It says, as Christians, if we are not careful, we could fall into a trap of shaving off the edges of the truth just to be liked. It's like lies are a circle and the truth is a, is a square. And the truth won't fit into a lie unless you shave off the edges of it. That's compromise. We cannot allow compromise to happen. We can't allow that. So we'll turn to jump into uh, Romans 1. It's probably the, uh, the most hated scripture in the world when it comes to uh, these identity crisis people and, and people, um, LGBT alphabet soup kind of, kind of people that um, they, they say, oh, I suppose you're probably going to jump into Romans 1. Well, yeah, we are. You know why? Because it's the truth. And that's on our side. We'll take it. So Romans 1, starting at the 18th, 18th verse. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in sinful desires of their hearts for sexual impurity for the de degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped, the serve, worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. It says there in the 18th verse, <clears throat> they suppress the truth with their wickedness. Suppress... I'm going to end up losing my voice. <laughs> Suppress means to forcibly put an end to something. To forcibly put an end to something, to stop something. So if you're going to forcibly put an end to something, it's got to be something that you have to begin with. Ken, I love you, brother. Maybe that will help. <laughs> so if you're going to forcibly um, suppress something, stop something, it has to be something that you have. To put an end to the truth is shaving off the edges so much that it's overtaken by lies. It says they knew God and they knew the truth, but it says in verse 23 that they exchanged the glory of God, of the immortal God, for idols. And in verse 25, it says they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. Uh, a lot of you know what I do for a living, but it, it's kind of odd, but I was just telling Carol this morning, <laughs> I kill prairie dogs. That's what I do for a living. And uh, we're licensed through the state. We go all over, we're licensed through like five states, Nebraska, we've been Kansas, Texas, New Mexico and Colorado, and, and we kill prairie dogs. And a lot of people don't like that. A lot of people love them little furry little things for some weird reason. Uh, they're definitely not ranchers. And, uh, but we do a lot of municipalities uh, and stuff. And, and in, like when we do parks and stuff in, in Denver and in, in cities, we usually do just a buffer around to keep them out of people's 
houses and, and yards and stuff. So we'll do like a 100, 200 foot buffer around and leave the population out in the middle of the parks and stuff. And we have people, um, when we work in the, in the cities, they, they come out and, and they will organize and they come out and they, they protest us. They'll stand in front of our machines and our trucks and stuff so that we can't go. And we end up having to call park rangers or the police or something to come and, and move them out of our way, you know, and help us to uh, be able to keep working and stuff. But they hate the fact that we're killing rodents for some reason. And, and uh, I had one lady, and she came up to me, and, and she's just crying these big. I was working in Bear Creek Park in, in Lakewood, just crying tears and just going off. And she goes, I can't believe how black your heart is that you can kill these poor little... She goes, they hug each other. I've seen it. She says, we need to be more like them. We need to be more like the animals. And, and I kind of stole this from Dr. Dobson. He used to be with, with uh, Focus on the Family. And he's got whatever he's with now, it's on that program. But um, I asked the lady, she's just standing there crying. I said, can I ask you a question? I said, what's your, what's your stance on abortion? She just stood there for, you know, and she's like, that doesn't have anything to do with this. And I said, well, kind, kind of does. I said, because the same people that will come out here and protest us are the same people that go to the Capitol steps and, and rally for abortion, you know. And she goes, oh, they're, they're completely different things. But I saw Dr. Dobson did this, and it was really cool. He had, and you could hear the pans moving around. He's on a radio show. But he made it sound like they're in the kitchen and they're cooking. And they were going to cook eagle eggs, bald eagle eggs. And they're, they're like going, oh, yeah, I like to use vegetable oil more. And he goes, hand me that, you know. The, and, they're do, and it's just a break. They were just making fun. But people started calling in irate, crazy irate. How dare you? Them are, them are endangered animals. How dare you cook eagle eggs and stuff? And, and he, he would ask them after they talk about it for a little bit what their stance on abortion was. And they would, you know, well, you know, we're, we're for abortion, you know. And he's like, so it's okay to kill a baby in the womb, but it's not okay to cook an eagle egg. And they're like, well, those eagles are going to grow up and be a big, beautiful, majestic bird if you allow it. And he goes, why isn't that fetus going to grow up and to be a big, beautiful, majestic person? What's the difference, you know, and they're like, and every one of them almost to just, it, uh, it was, every one of them said, there's enough people in the world, but eagles are endangered. And, and they worship the wrong things. They're looking at God through the, they're not looking at God through the truth. They're looking at the wrong thing. They're worshiping the wrong thing. They're worshiping animals. They're worshiping things that they shouldn't be worshiping rather than what they have there. Um, it's nothing but lies and, and uh, it's completely devoid of the truth. If we look at uh, Romans one thirty two at the end of that chapter there, it says, although they knew God's righteous decree and the they, if you look right above it, it says they, they are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They're senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. That's the they. They know God's righteous decree. They understand that there's a God and, and, and who God is. That those who do such things deserve death. They not only continue to do these very things, but approve of those that practice it. Again, they know God, and they know what they're doing is wrong, but they continue to do it. They've exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And right below it there in 2.2, in it says, Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such thing is based on the truth. God's judgment is based on the truth. That same truth that they rejected is the same truth that they will be judged by. Let's turn to, to 2 John. Clear back by revelation. Clear back in the back of your Bible. 
Second John. It's probably the, the shortest book in the Bible. And being it's the shortest book in the Bible, we're going to read the whole book. You can, you can end your, your year off, 2023. I read a book of the Bible. Second John, it says the elder, which, which is John the, the apostle, to the chosen lady and her children whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that we walk in love. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is a deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. And whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. I have much to write to you, but I, am not, I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit with you and talk to you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your chosen sister send their greetings. The first six verses here, this is kind of cut in half. The first six verses uh, are a beautiful picture of, of Christian joy. Uh, it talks about truth and love and about the commands of Christ. Commands are not suggestions. They're not suggestions that are left up to the hearer uh, as to whether or not they want to believe it. Commands are according to the the Greek word, authoritative teaching and authoritative prescription. The commands are based on truth, authoritative truth from Jesus Christ. In the fifth verse, it says, I am not writing you a new command, but one that you have had from the beginning. I ask that you love one another. In John 13, 34, Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Verse 6, it says, And this is love that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you've heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. But then verse 7, 7 to the end, it's kind of the flip side of all of that. It talks about deceivers, like the ones that we met in Romans 1. Uh, They know God, but they look to suppress the truth by their wickedness. It says that they are deceivers and the Antichrist. Not the big A Antichrist that we meet in Revelation. These are Antichrist. It's people, Antichrist means against God. Anti means against. I'm against God. So you're Antichrist's are people that are just against Christ and against God. In verse 9, it says, Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. The teachings of Christ is is the authoritative teaching or the authoritative prescriptions uh, used by the word command uh, in the first six verses. They were, these deceivers, uh, were tainting the word of God. Uh, They had taken it and were making it uh, something that it wasn't. They were attempting to take the authority out of the command by shaving off the edges of the truth. Deceit is another word for lie. Satan is the deceiver, the great deceiver and the liar, 
uh, the father of lies. It says he was a, a liar from the beginning. Um, and it says not to welcome him. Verse 11 says anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. Um, the, the same is in Romans 132 where it says that they, they knew the lies and they approve of those that practice it. It, it's, it says here to, to not do that, to, to stop that. They approve of those that practice it. I've seen pictures looking through the internet of churches with a, flag, with a rainbow flag behind the pastor. That's, that's a lie. They're li- that, they lie. It's, it's based on lies. And there were other ones, and pastors you would know if I said their names, that have out on the front of their church had BLM <laughs> flags hanging that they were in support, and they, some of them actually went and marched in BLM uh, marches and stuff. And the, the, the main premise of BLM is that they're against God and they're against family. If you read it, their first two premises are that. The, the main things that they are against is God and family. They want to destroy them things. And it says that they not only do this, but they approve of people that do it. They shave off the edges of the truth just enough to where, you know, oh, okay, you know, we we want them people to come into our church, so we're going to accept them. We're not going to accept them based on that. I've seen a, 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 a pastor speaking with a girl, and she's, she was a lesbian, and, and she said, uh, he's, they were talking about that, and he says, yeah, we, I, I would, I'd love to have you in my church, but I can't accept the, the way that you live. He goes, I love you, but I, I can't accept that. And she goes, I don't want to be loved. I want to be accepted. And it, it, if, you, if you understand the fact that God is love and, and that we are to love, that, that just rips that apart. I, she's basically saying, I don't want God. I want you to want me. I want to be the focus of this. And, and the way that they live, and it's just, it just rips you apart to hear people say that. Uh, people say that Christians aren't tolerant. Um, they feel that we should be accepting of everything because we're Christians, and that's the way we should be. Uh, I mean, after all, aren't we supposed to love our neighbors and love our enemies? But when we put biblical bounds, and we should put biblical bounds on things, we're called unloving and intolerant because of those bounds. It's true, we are called to love, but it is also true that we are called to not love. In 1 John, if you just turn, mine's just one page over. 1 John 2. 1 John 2.15. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. We as Christians do not have to be tolerant of everything that goes or anything that goes against the nature of God. Ron Fuchs did a, a really good study a while back uh, in his Sunday school class uh, on the attributes of God and the true nature of God. Uh, and although he is God, there are things that God cannot do. God cannot lie. He has bounds. There are bounds to, to what he does. He can't do anything that is outside of his perfect nature. But the world, and, and the world that it's talking about here, do not love the world. The world is the spiritual realm that is, that is controlled and ruled by Satan. It's not terra firma or, you know, the, the earth or the cosmos or whatever. It's, it's that, the, the world is that, uh, that spiritual realm that Satan controls. And it's full of lies and deceit. And it is what the, the two passages in Romans and Second John uh, have pointed out. The spiritual realm <clears throat> is controlled by Satan. And it's seen again right here. It's probably on your same page. It is mine. 1 John 4, 1. It 
1 John 4, 1, it says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and is even now already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We, however, are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how you recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. That's discernment, is being able to understand the difference between the spirit of truth and the spirit of false. What's, what's lies and what's truth, what's square and what's round. There is a line drawn by God, and we are not to tolerate that, that goes against the nature of God, which is the truth. I know I got a little bit off topic here. I, I wanted to talk about the nuggets a little more, but <laughs> if you want to talk that when we're done here, I'll, I'll meet with you. I can talk basketball all, all day if you want to, but uh, but the, the things that attack our faith and the places and the ways in which we worship, they're not going, they're not going away. They're not going to stop. They're going to get stronger and more bolden. So we should too. We should be stronger and more bold in the way that we battle this and the way that we discern right from wrong. We're stronger in numbers which is why we meet here, which is why, why we do this. We don't just sit at home and watch on our little screen or something. We, we meet together because we're stronger in numbers, and we have to have this. We have to know the truth, and we have to stand together in the truth because the truth is so very important. If the truth is the reason that they're coming at us, and it is, if the truth is the reason that they're coming at us, then let the truth be the hill that we fight on. Pull out your swords and sharpen up the edges of the truth. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the truth that we find in it. We thank you for your commands, for your authoritative prescriptions that you give us. We pray, Father, that we be strong enough to walk in that truth to not shave off the edges, but to be proud of what we have and to be proud of who we are. Don't let them things infiltrate our faith. Don't let them things infiltrate our church, our marriages, our families. Keep us strong in the truth, Father. Help us to hold on to it tightly. And we thank you for all of it that it is. Father, we, we pray that you be with Sherry O'Connor this morning and, and with her family and with the Kofer family and and uh, we just pray a blessing on them of the loss uh, of Joe, and we pray that you just be with them in the coming days. Give them peace, Father. Give them perfect peace, that peace that passes all understanding. That means that we don't get it. We'll never understand it. It's, it's, a, it's something we'll never, we'll never get, but it's there, and we know it's there because it's, it's prescribed by you. It's a peace that's given by you. And we thank you for that, Father. And we pray that you just give them that peace. Watch over us, Father, in this coming year. Help us to be strong individually. Help us to be strong in, together. Help us to be a family of God where we need to be. We pray, Father, that you just bless us. We've got a whole year ahead of us. Bless us in that year. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.